Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! I picked up a few unsavory addictions in grade 10. Cigarettes, to Xanax, to opioids, Oxycontin and Percocet. I was very depressed and I changed schools for my senior year to a smaller school where I knew most of the people. I was trying to start new with old friends and new people. Well, some rumors followed me. I was still a heavy stoner and so were my friends at this school. This caused some unwanted attention. Some people just don't care to hide it. It became problematic a few months into the school year when an anonymous letter was sent into the school claiming to be concerned for my well-being saying that I was going to school high, smoking with my friends on breaks. Partially true, by the way. I managed to avoid punishment because there wasn't anything to back it up, and the principal and vice principal weren't happy about the anonymous nonsense. Then came a few more letters saying that I was selling pills to younger kids, pressuring them into taking them. They claimed they had 12 plus kids' parents on board to pull their kids if I wasn't expelled. My parents were pissed. Some of my teachers started treating me differently. Kids I have been friends with distanced themselves. It caused me to relapse hard and ruined my grades. I made it past it all, didn't get expelled, passed my courses and still have a few friends from the school. Now on to the culprit. This lady, she had sent letters to kids I knew saying everybody hated them, they should leave the school and so on. We knew it was her in the previous instances because of a WhatsApp number she used to threaten someone, and anonymous letters written in the same word style got attributed to her. She is a psycho, always meddling, even in her younger daughter's nonsense, who was 10 or 11 at the time, keeping her kids from hanging out with kids she doesn't like or whose parents she doesn't like. Today, I read an article about two years after the fact, saying their non-profit is being sued by the province I live in for embezzlement, accused of stealing $4 million through a few shell corporations, some bogus program they literally sold to themselves through another company they own, and some other nonsense I don't want to get into. I feel bad for her daughter, she was chill when we were younger but screw her mom. I never did anything to hurt anybody at that school. I kept my head down and tried to deal with my demons, and she didn't let me. But karma? Got her. So it's cool. I decided to share my story. It all took place 17 years ago, but I feel like it belongs here. At the time, I was 20 years old and dated my first true love. We have been together for one and a half years already and everything was just great. Her mother really liked me and she had her own company, which traded fashion clothes for kids. She made a ton of money. They needed someone to drive on their 3.5T truck and she came up with an idea to hire me. I was unhappy with the job I had, so as a win-win situation, I accepted her offer and we started working together. Job was okay, even though I had to work a huge amount of overtime. She thoroughly introduced me to how the whole company worked. She had a huge storage facility, a store and two trucks, one that I drove and a big one. I worked for her for like one year and in that time, I knew every single thing about the company because she trusted me with the dirty secret. This later came in handy. This is where things took a huge turn. I found out that my girlfriend cheated on me with her ex, and as a result I broke up with her instantly. It was an ugly situation, and after it went down, I called her mother and told her what was going on and that I don't want to mix things with business, so I will still be there for work even though I don't want to see her daughter again. She said everything is alright but of course she sided with her daughter and I felt that she's mad at me because of the breakup. I went to work and acted as a professional should. Took all the drama aside, however, soon after she singled me out, she started looking for mistakes so she could discipline me. This has been going on for months and I realized she was just waiting for an excuse to fire me but I wasn't gonna give that reason to her that easily. She was pissed that she couldn't find big mistakes and the small ones she often just made up was not enough to terminate me, so she came up with a plan. On the truck, we had a power generator which provided a light and a power for a laptop, printer, and so on. It worked in two ways. 
with fuel when we were on a road and with cable, in case we were at the storage. But it was not made by a company. They just hired an electrician for that and he made an error. So we had to flip a switch all the time if we used it with a cable connection. Otherwise, it would burn down. As I loaded the truck, she convinced the co-worker to flip the switch back. And after a few minutes, the lights were gone and I noticed something was wrong. It burned out, of course, but I knew I didn't forget the switch because I had been loading the truck for an hour and it only took five minutes. Stops to burn out, so it couldn't be me. She didn't even hear me out. Started yelling, fired me on the spot. I stated that she was going to pay the repairs out of my last salary, so I wouldn't expect any money from her. I didn't take that lightly and told her that I don't think you want to go this way with me. But she refused to listen. It took a few days for me to cool down, but I wanted to give her a last chance. I called her and told her even though I knew what was going on, and she did set me up, but if I get my money, I will call it an end. We don't have to see each other again. She told me to get lost, so I came up with a plan. First, because I knew that the store she had didn't have a bathroom, which was illegal in my country. The shop assistants had an agreement with a restaurant on the opposite side to go there if they needed. I reported this to the authorities and the next day, they closed the shop because of this violation and told her she can't open up until they have a bathroom. She called me right away and asked me if I had anything to do with this. I laughed and told her, didn't I tell you that you don't want to go this way with me? And hung up. I knew that we worked so much overtime that me and the other truck driver had so much overdrive on the tackle cards. It records how many hours you drive and how fast and when you stopped. So I called the authorities again and told them everything. They went and checked all the records and gave the company a brutal fine. She sent me obscene text messages all day long after that. I replied, ain't done yet. Then silence. A few hours went by, my phone rang. She called and asked me if we could talk it over. She even said she sent me my last paycheck, but I shut her down immediately and told her, too late for that. And I called the fire department and told them that the wires they had in the walls of the store were outdated, which caused short circuits daily and that they only have two fire extinguishers for the whole place when they should have like 12 to 15. On that very day, they had to close the storage as well as she lost the last place where she could make money for months. Until they got everything up to date and renewed all the wires which cost a huge amount of money. Because of the fines she got from the different authorities, she couldn't afford these renovations of course. A few months later, she filed for bankruptcy and I know because my ex-girlfriend called me with I hope you're happy, you jerk. You made my family bankrupt. I never got my paycheck, but at that point, I didn't even care anymore. I was happy with the outcome. I hope you enjoyed my story. Update. I got a bunch of messages from people asking questions and I thought the best way is to make an update instead of typing the same thing to everyone over and over again. Let's get into it. So after a few months, the tax department tour. As some of you know it, the IRS took almost everything from her. Store, stuff, storage, trucks, the whole nine yards. She got so many fines from different authorities she could not pay it. So after everything was gone, she sold her house, moved to a smaller apartment and never owned a business again. As far as I know, she works in a store as a clerk. Things are not looking good. My ex-girlfriend, well, she got married to the next guy and now they have four kids. After the second child, she really let herself go. And now, I'm just happy that I didn't have a child from her. I'm not going to fat shame her, but at least they are still together, so maybe, just maybe, she learned a lesson and did not cheat on him. Or so I hope. About me, I had a long relationship after her. My son was born, but she was a lazy gold digger, so after five years, so after five years we separated. I've made the love of my life after that and since almost 9 years we are still happy together. She also got out of a terrible relationship, abuse and domestic violence. So she truly appreciates me and vice versa. I love her to death. I hope I answered all the questions. Love you all. Bye. As a new mother, I have been struggling with dizziness episodes that seem to come out of nowhere. At first, I thought it was just a result of the stress and lack of sleep that comes with caring for a newborn. 
But my doctor recently told me that I had an inner ear disturbance that was causing these episodes. The dizziness could be debilitating at times, making it difficult for me to even stand up or walk around. I have been trying to manage the symptoms with medication and vestibular rehabilitation therapy, but it has been a challenging and overwhelming experience. I hope that with time and treatment, I will be able to get these dizziness episodes under control and return to my normal life. On beautiful morning, I decided to go to our local store to grab some groceries and I decided to take my 5-month-old baby with me in his stroller. At that time, we were just getting used to the idea of putting our baby in a stroller and I thought it would be good for both of us to take him for a trip in it as the weather was really nice outside that day. So I asked my husband to take us to the store so we could grab what we needed. We arrived at the store, my husband pushing our car to me pushing our baby stroller. As we walked through the aisles and stacked our cart with groceries, I suddenly felt a sharp pain in my stomach. The dizziness hit me hard and I lost my balance, collapsing to the ground. I lay there shivering and in pain as people gathered around me trying to help. It usually takes me a few minutes to regain my senses after one of these episodes, but this time I was jolted back to reality by a loud scream. I looked up to see a blonde woman with short hair reaching into our stroller, grabbing my crying baby and walking towards the exit of the store. My baby! I screamed with everything I had. Customers were looking at me strangely and confused. But my husband understood. He looked over the stroller, saw it was empty, and then bolted in the direction I was pointing. Later, I learned that my husband had caught up to the woman right at the gate. He screamed for the guard to stop her, yelling that she was kidnapping his son. The guard tried to block her way, but she fought back, slapping and scratching. My husband had to wrestle her to snatch our boy out of her filthy arms. While all that was happening, I was being escorted by a couple of other customers to the sound of commotion. And the moment I saw my baby between his father's arms, I rushed to the detained woman sitting on the ground until the cops arrived, and I need her face was all I had. And people had to hold me back until the police arrived and arrested her for attempted kidnapping. I was overwhelmed with gratitude and relief as I held my baby close. Thankful that my husband and the guard had been able to rescue him and that the perpetrator had been caught. It was a terrifying and traumatic experience, but I knew that my family was safe. And that was all that mattered. And yeah, for those asking what's happened to her, she got sentenced to 10 years in prison. But last I heard, the inmates decided to give her the business once they knew what she's in for. She is currently getting treated at a hospital with too many broken bones to count. I asked my father to write this up and I said I will post it. The story has always given me a laugh. Please enjoy. I worked for a large computer assembly plant in the western United States in the late 1990s. I was a lead tech for the value-added reseller. When we were able to reach a zero-missed service level agreement time, the MSLAT, we were promised a pay increase and a team party. I managed to lead my team to this level and maintained it for three months. No other lead or site manager was able to reach it, let alone maintain it for three months. I had five six to handle travel calls for 1,500 employees. I asked Karen, Jeff, when we were going to get our raises and party. He only said soon, and then said if you don't maintain it for another three months, you will lose it. That was not the incentive I was promised when I took the job, so I complained to the home office. Jeff called me into his office and threatened to have me demoted if I went over his head again. The company had an open-door policy that contained a zero-retaliation clause. I again contacted the home office and was told Jeff was given the funds, $500, and the budget increased to cover $6.50 per hour, $1.5 for the on-site lead, and $1 per hour per tech. For raises to our pay, the first month we hit the MSLAT goal. Now, I'm just a bit irked. So I confronted Jeff with a report from the home office. I also reminded him of the no retaliation policy. He did not know that the home office told me the amounts of funds allotted. He then asked me who I thought I was going over his head. I am the lead for this site and I have a responsibility to my techs for their rewards, for their commitments and extra effort. I said. He shrieked. You will mind your place and find another job. So about two weeks went by and we finally got to our party. 
buy pizzas at $10 each and a pre-made cake from a local grocery store that said good job on it at $30. I got a 15 cents per hour raise and each tick received 10 cents per hour. We have been promised $1.50 and $1 per hour. Do the math. The party cost $80 and the Tex and I got 65 cents per hour raises. When I asked about that discrepancy, Jeff said the party funds were cut to $100 and he was only allowed a $1 per hour raise to share with the team. I was working on contacting the home office again when he called me into his office to terminate me at the site and told me to report to the home office for relocation on Monday. When I got to the home office, I was handed termination papers for the company. They, the personnel officer, and Jeff were there to process me out. I read the form reason for leaving very carefully and noticed I could send it to the corporate headquarters out of state if I so elected. The address was printed on a form. They tried to stop me from doing that by saying you must give it to Jeff for processing. I told him what was written on a form and I elected to send it to the headquarters and walked out of the office. I sent my papers the next day, registered to the company headquarters the next day, and I learned that two weeks after I sent my papers into the company headquarters, with all the above information on it, that they, Jeff and the personnel officer, were let go. Apparently, they were doing the same thing with four other sites and pocketing the difference. This is not the end of the story. Read on. I landed a job at a startup software company that lasted four and a half years until the dot-com boom went bust. 18 months into my new job, I had to expand the company network into two other buildings. I contacted the well-known local network equipment provider for prices and availability along with two other vendors. Each of the vendors visited the facility and provided quotes that were fairly close in price, but had delivery times longer than I'd hoped. The well-known company, however, was a different case. I spoke to the senior sales representative. I spoke to the senior sales representative who told me he would have a sales representative that handled the brand I wanted contact me to make arrangements for a visit to my office. The sales representative said they could be there the next day to determine placement and capacity so they could provide a quote. Our receptionist let me know the network equipment guys were there. I grabbed the keys for the buildings and headed to the lobby. When I got there, I got a sick feeling when I saw Jeff. He was a representative for the network gear I wanted. He greeted me like I was a long-lost friend. I held my cool and greeted him in the most professional manner I could muster. I got through this and received a quote which was higher than usual. I had done business with this reseller before. I was pleased with the result. However, when I got the breakdown of the quote, I noticed the prices quoted with other resellers was 15% higher than the others, and the labor cost was about 10% higher. I informed the local company that I was not selecting them for the business. When the senior sales manager asked why, I gave him the reason. I shared the pricing information and the history behind Jeff. He was shocked as these were not the numbers Jeff had shown him for the quote. I told him I could not trust Jeff because he was just as dishonest as ever. This cost him a large chunk of business as I had already awarded the business to one of the other vendors. I did not see or hear about Jeff until six years later. It is now six years later and I'm in a Fortune 500 company setting up and maintaining a data center, PCs and network equipment. We need to replace some aging servers and we had representatives from all the brands coming into the office. Yes, indeed, there was a Jeff as a representative for a well-known brand of server. He again greeted me as a long-lost friend. I greeted him with a simple hello. He tried to engage me in conversation, but I politely excused myself as I had some high-priority maintenance operations that needed my attention. Later that afternoon, my manager asked me if I knew the sales representative as he had mentioned it to my manager. I said yes, I know him and his reputation. Oh, he seems very nice and eager to please us, my manager says. I asked if I could speak honestly about him. Jeff? He said he wanted me to be honest. I gave him all the details of the encounters and behaviors. I told him not to trust what he says, the equipment we get, the cost of the items, and to get it in writing. Well, the first invoice arrived for the equipment we needed and the price was higher than quoted. When my management challenged the cost and delivery periods, 
As not what was agreed to, Jeff's boss was embarrassed and angry at the bait switch Jeff pulled. It turned out he was adding unnecessary items to what we asked for as forgotten necessary parts. These items were not only unnecessary, but used and sold to us as new. Long story short, long story I know, but the end result is Jeff was terminated for misrepresenting the cost, brought up on fraud charges for changing signed invoices and criminal charges of embezzlement. This happened over five years ago, but I was reminded of it when my oldest was going through pictures. It's kind of long, so sorry in advance. In hindsight, going to the zoo as a service dog was not one of my best ideas, but my kids were still at the age where they liked it. Plus, my friend had her kids for the summer. Spoiler, no one tried to steal my dog. After getting tickets, I am asked to go to the office so they can notify zoo security that there is a service dog in a zoo and to let me know what areas of the zoo I cannot go in. Basically, I couldn't go into any of the areas where the animals roam freely. Completely understandable. I finished up with the office, we start walking around and one of the first big cat's enclosures we see is a jaguar. So beautiful, but I hate how small the enclosure is. I hate the zoo personally. And this is when the entitled parents start. Usually during the day most of the animals are laying down, but today I brought a dog into the zoo. The jaguar caught the scent of my dog and became extremely restless. The way the enclosure was built, only a chain link fence and three feet separated us. My dog was just sitting next to me with this beautiful and deadly animal staring at us. Because the jaguar was active and close to the fence, people kept coming. Very quickly, I was trapped between the fence and a crowd. I have my dog for mobility and anxiety issues. Getting out of that crowd was difficult. Thankfully, my friend's fiancé saw me and pulled me out of there. When my friends saw the crowd building, they grabbed my kids and pulled them away. So that was a jaguar exhibit. Thankfully, the next closure was one that I couldn't go in, so I got to sit down for a bit. During this, I had a mom with two kids. Young, but I don't know how old. Demand I go back to the jaguar so her kids could see him up close. Told her no, not happening. And she did the whole whining and yelling thing, but at that point, my kids and friends showed up. Told her no again and left. She started following us. But it's a zoo. I can't tell her where she can't walk as long as she's not bothering me. Next big enclosure we get is the wild dogs. This enclosure has viewing glass instead of chain link fencing. They perk up when they catch my dog scent as well. And again, we draw a crowd. This time I have a lot of young kids pushed up to the front. Guess what? The kids have short attention spans. They saw the wild dogs and they saw my dog. They were more interested in my dog. That exhibit was hell gain out of is I didn't want to hurt any of the kids. So now instead of just one annoying mother dragging her kids behind us, we have multiple entitled parents with kids. Every enclosure we see, this crowd would push to get up front. If I left before one of them got to see the animal, they would demand I go back. Each enclosure, I was losing my grip on my timber. My friends saw this and did their best to try to keep me calm. We're at the tiger exhibit next and now I am wondering if the zoo even feeds the animal. The tiger is pacing and staring and gauging distance, trying to get to us. After about a minute of that, I couldn't stay there anymore. I was terrified that the tiger would take the risk and jump. But again, the crowd. Now I've had enough. I ended up telling the crowd to back up and get away from me. These parents got mad at me for using harsh language in front of their young children. How could I? Now my revenge. Monkeys do not like dogs. At all. They will go nuts if I go near their enclosure. Well, I had this lovely crowd of entitled parents who refused to leave us alone and we are coming up on some of the monkeys. Once the rest of the crowd caught up, I started going towards the monkey exhibit. My friends took my kids around the enclosure in case I didn't get out fast enough. As soon as I got close, the monkeys started yelling and jumping. The crowd was so excited. The monkeys never jumped around. I got to the beginning of the exhibit and rushed through as fast as I could. Limited mobility sucks, but it was a crab that had feces thrown at him. Afterwards, I was sitting with my kids and friends when one of the women came up to me, yelling about 
how she never had monkeys throw gifts at her before, and it's all my fault. Her screaming drew the attention of one of the zoo's security. After the woman started yelling at him about how awful I am, and how she now had monkey gifts in her hair, that it's my fault. He asked me what she meant. I told him about how no matter where we went in the zoo, a crowd followed us and made the whole visit miserable. That woman started yelling that it's my fault for bringing a dog to the zoo, and if I didn't want attention, then I should have stayed home. At that point, we were done with the zoo and decided to go get something to eat. And this is how I learned that taking a service dog to the zoo is a bad idea. Thankfully, my kids are old enough that if they want to go to the zoo, they can go by themselves. My boy and I prefer places that have AC. So I made my usual stop at the local gas station this morning only to find the parking lot full of cars. I expected to find a line, but as soon as I walk in the door, I'm greeted by a woman, the Karen of our story, along with her six crotch goblins. They are raiding the candy rack, and she obviously has no control of the situation, nor does she seem to care. They are plucking out the main access to the store, and a gentleman, the hero of the story, walks in behind me. Myself, being a non-confrontational person, I'm assessing the safest way around as he politely says excuse me, so I step to the side. He makes the same approach to the Karen and her kids, to which she angrily snaps her head up at him and says, I'm sorry, can't you see my children are picking out their candy? He can wait, it will only take a second. He looks back at me to which I just shrug and opt to go around the tie back aisles, avoiding the stock boxes on the floor. He follows me and we both come around at the drink coolers, where I proceed to snag a drink. About to move on, the dreaded throat clearing erupts from behind us. You two are unbelievable. My children were about to get a drink, and you just shoved your way around them. Do either of you have any manners? The guy smiles and says, My friend, I was just grabbing our drink. You can wait. It will only take a second. Her face turned red, but she kept her mouth shut. As I had suspected, the line was not short and I managed to make it there before this evil woman, but now had to endure the entire clan behind me. They were whining, complaining, and kept leaving the lion to get more things. It was like she was running a circus or something. I saw the cashier keep looking in her direction, and I could see the dread on her face that told me this was not the end of my adventure with this woman. Then I hear one of the children say, Mommy, look, they have pizza. I noticed. There were three slices left, and she was trying to figure out how they could split them evenly. I am now trying to justify buying all of these slices when my hero walks over and helps himself to the last three pieces on a warmer. I didn't have to look back to know what was coming, and there it was in a voice that echoed through the store. Hey, jerk! Those belong to my kids. They asked for them first, so you better give them to me now. He smiled and said, Lady, if you wanted them, you should have gotten them. She huffed. You obviously don't need all of those, so at least give me two. There is no way you need three slices that big. He grinned and said, Sure I do. One for now, and the other two for my two breaks at work. I love this guy. She started screeching, had the guy in the language of the Karens, and I just tried to tune her out. The children start screaming and crying when at last she turns her attention to the cashier and starts demanding she make more pizza. The cashier looks at her and says, our policy is that the pizza can only be made in downtime intervals, and it being a holiday, will probably be a while seeing as she was the only one running the store. That's nonsense. I'm coming here all the time and know the owner. Let me speak to him right now. I'm going to have you fired and this man removed from the store. At this point, I'm laughing to myself because... I do know the owner, and I see the biggest grin come across the cashier's face. Ah, uh, that's funny, because I know all the regulars in this tour, and I have never seen you before. As for talking to the owner, would you like to speak with me or my spouse? Karen shut up and snatched everything from her children. She started stuffing it anywhere she could and shoved her screaming horde out of the door. The guy still bought the pizza and between him, myself and the cashier, we all shared a good laugh. I mean, I know holidays can bring out the worst in people, but wow. 
Want two crates of milk, a train slash coach journey, two shopping trolleys full of waste and unpaid overtime have in common. A great malicious compliance story from my days in supermarkets. At this time, I was a department manager in the third biggest supermarket chain in the country. I knew how to do my job and do it well. And even though we were entitled to a four-week holiday every year, I only ever took two. I am that dedicated to my job. Anyway, I decided that I wanted to have my annual holiday. I made sure I gave plenty of notice to my store manager, about three months notice. In recent months, there had been a pretty big turnover of staff. So therefore, anyone that was able to fill in for me was no longer there. On top of that, delivery schedules had changed. So as a result, I would often be coming in on a day off to do orders and do some general tidying up. Unpaid, of course, since this company absolutely hated paying overtime. I didn't mind, I was dedicated to my job. I asked my store manager when I put in for my holidays, which were approved straight away, who he would like me to train up to run the department while I was on holiday. He said we can wait until closer to the date. I was fine with that. I asked again about two months out and then one month out. Again, he said we can wait until closer to the date. Two weeks before my holidays, and still I had not trained anyone to cover for me. I started talking to one of my friends there who was keen on getting experience in other departments and started showing her a few things. It was about this time that the store manager started having to come in on my day off to do reports for head office. When he saw me in as well, he asked me to stop coming in and doing overtime. I said that I had to because of the delivery schedule, and he simply told me to do the orders earlier, and that me coming in on my days off makes his statistics look bad. I'm not getting paid, so what statistics? I then asked him about training someone, and he said so-and-so knows how to do orders. He can do it. This person had no idea how to do orders for my department. There were different systems and requirements to ordering. I said I would be happy to show someone, and he ordered me to go away. Fine. One week before going on holidays, I tried to sneak in to do the orders to comply with the delivery schedule. I was just about done when the store manager came in. He sees me and calls me into the office. Once again, he says he doesn't want to see me here on a day off, no matter what. He says when I get back from holidays, He's going to call in HR and says that there may be a warning going on to my file as a result. Again, a company complaining about unpaid overtime. I also mentioned that there is more to running my department than just putting an order into the system. There is calculating what to order, where to order, how to run specials on the right products and so on. And the store manager simply replies, anyone can do it. It's not difficult. Oh, fine. If he wants to be like that, I can be like that. Cue the malicious compliance. For the next week, I made sure there was absolutely no unpaid overtime. I clocked on exactly on time to the second and clocked off at the exact time to the second. If there was a late delivery that came in and there were two large ones that did, I just left in the middle of the delivery. I told the duty manager what the story manager had said and just walked out. By the end of the week, day before my holidays begin, the store manager had me in his office wanting to know why I didn't look after the deliveries. And I told him what he said about the no unpaid overtime. He said I have responsibilities as a department manager and that I was neglecting them by not taking the deliveries. I turned around and asked him if he was going to pay me overtime and he said no. I asked him if he was going to authorize unpaid overtime and he said no. So I asked him what I was supposed to do, and he replied, Your job. Then told me to get out of his office. I finished for the day, glad to be on holidays. I only had a couple of hours to get home, change out of my work clothes, and head off to catch the train. I was traveling overnight at around 3.30 a.m. I changed to a coach for the rest of my journey, getting to my destination at 5.30 a.m., and I turned my phone on while sitting at the coach terminal and almost immediately I have several messages from work. There was a message about a problem with the bread delivery. All things that could have been easily sorted if I had been allowed to train someone. But I don't ring them back. I'm on holiday. And if I ring them back to help them fix up problems, I am not. Am I not technically doing unpaid overtime? 
even if I'm not on site, I'm still doing my job essentially. A couple of days later, I checked in with one of my friends at work just to see how things are going. They tell me the mess that my department and the whole store has suddenly become. We both laughed about it because we knew what was going to happen. She told me that they were getting a department manager from another store to come in to try to fix the mess, but she doesn't think it will help. My holidays finish and I go back to work, expecting a crap show. My second day back, the store manager had me in his office with someone from HR and he already had a written report filled out. The area manager then comes into the office, sits down and starts to talk. He wants to know why I let the department go the way it did. And then I told the area manager everything. I told him about how I was coming in to do unpaid overtime. I was told to stop or I would get a warning. He asked about supervising someone so they could take over while I was on holidays. I told him that I repeatedly asked and the store manager didn't see the need. I was asked why I didn't answer any of my phone calls and I again stated about the unpaid overtime doing my job and training someone to do my job. I was then asked to leave the office and go back to work. I don't know what happened after I left but the store manager was rather cranky, especially towards me, for a couple of weeks. I never got a warning either. And just for the record, the cost of my malicious compliance is as follows. Extra wages for the people who had to come in to fix things up. Nearly $1,000 of waste from two shopping trolleys of goods that were never marked down. Lost sales from the lack of bread to sell. $600 waste from wrong products ordered and couldn't be sold. Lost sales from empty shelves.